I'm Tom Rowland, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey everybody, this is Tom Rowland, and today's show features a good friend of mine, Miles Berghoff. Miles Berghoff is the co-host of Sweetwater Television with Joey Nania, and these guys travel all over the place and fish for uh, mostly freshwater fish, but some saltwater. Miles and I have a good conversation about how he got started, what the world of sponsorship looks like, how does somebody get into this world, what are the most common questions that people are asking both of us, and a little bit of advice both given to us by mentors that have really played a big part in the success that we've both had in the in the fishing world and, and in the sponsorship world and just understanding that world and seeing what it is that as an angler we're trying to accomplish to best serve the sponsor. A lot of people don't quite understand that. And luckily, we both had some good mentors that that helped us out along the way. So that knowledge is shared as well as uh, what Miles does on the road, what he listens to, how a bass fisherman travels around the country. Is it lonely? You bet. Is it uh, uh, sometimes boring? Probably very often, but this conversation is not boring. Miles is a good conversationalist that likes to laugh and have a good time. I learned a few things from this. So we will get to that right after this. This episode is brought to you by Waypoint TV. Waypoint TV is an online platform where you can get your favorite hunting and fishing shows for free on any device at any time. You can literally go there and find the device that you want, and there's either an app or you can download the app onto your smart TV or to your Apple TV. You can get it on your phone, your tablet, Android, Apple, doesn't matter. Uh, this is available all over the place, and the inventory of shows that they have is really getting to be impressive. Uh, short films and some of the best saltwater, freshwater, fly fishing, uh, you name it, it's on there, plus hunting, and it's free. So go to waypointtv.com, check it out, download the app, do whatever you need to to get it on your favorite device, and start watching your shows, quit DVRing them. Quit staying home on Saturday morning. Actually go fishing on Saturday morning. That's a novel idea. You could actually go fishing instead of sitting at home watching your fishing shows. Then you can watch your fishing shows when you're going, you know, to work in the Uber, in, on the subway, wherever you're going. These things are available to you. So check out waypointtv.com and find out how you want to watch your favorite outdoor shows and then start binging. Binge away. So today's episode with Miles Berghoff starts now. Everybody, meet Miles Berghoff. So tonight, I'm sitting here at my house with one of my friends, and this guy and I have been working together for a few years. He is a tournament bass fisherman and an all-around good guy that came into my life because we started a new project. So a lot of people know that we do saltwater experience. Some people know that we also produce a show called Into the Blue, and even a smaller group of people might know that we also, my company also does a show called Sweetwater. And Sweetwater is a bass fishing show primarily, but a freshwater show that uh, tackles all different kinds of fish. Last year, I think they fished for pike and muskie and smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, crappie, anything, trout. It's a freshwater show. So Saltwater Experience is the show that I'm on with Rich. We fish in, um, in Florida primarily in shallow flats for redfish, permit, tarpon, bonefish, sharks, those kind of fish. There's an offshore kind of offshoot of that show called Into the Blue with Steve Roger and Scott Walker. And they fish offshore for, uh, you know, the fish that they like to catch, sailfish, uh, tuna, dolphin, all kinds of stuff offshore. And then we also serve another part of the market with the, uh, with the freshwater show. So I was tasked uh, a few years ago, I guess it's four years ago now, that this is, a, this is a project that we wanted to tackle. Rich and I talked about it. We thought about, okay, what is a, a show that we should do? And we thought a freshwater show would be excellent. 
So I was tasked with finding, with creating a list, coming up with a list of people that might be good hosts for this show. I thought about one guy immediately that I had spent a weekend with traveling, young guy, full of excitement and energy, just on fire for the sport, on fire for, for fishing. And uh, his name was Joey Nania. And Joey and I had traveled all around um, uh, Mobile, Alabama, over to Louisiana to, to uh, do these Bass Pro Shop seminars. And I got to spend a lot of time in the car with him. I was very impressed with Joey. So Joey was on, on the list. And I, I looked around, met with quite a few other bass fishermen, talked to one of my friends, Lewis Wellen, who is a, a mentor of mine from Oakley. Lewis was my first, um, first sponsor that really uh, took an interest in, in me and developing me as, a, uh, a, as someone who could know anything about sponsorship. Lewis was very, very patient with me. And really, I learned a, a ton about sponsorship, what companies are looking for, what, uh, how, how I can be of a good servant and do a good job for a sponsor. So when Lewis tells me that he knows somebody that I might want to talk to, I'm listening. And uh, Lewis tells me, he gives me one name. He says, Miles Berghoff. He says, Miles is your guy. That's, that's it. That's your guy. So when I heard that, I was like, okay, well, if you're telling me that, that this guy is my guy, then I'm going to check it out. So I went and uh, made a phone call to Miles. Miles was uh, uh, excited about the opportunity. I went to fish with him, and I was equally as impressed with Miles. So it's fun to have Miles here. He drove the big hook wrapped truck right up into my driveway. We went out to dinner tonight. And Miles is in the house tonight. Miles Berghoff. It's good to be here. All right. All right. <laughs> long, long introduction to, uh, to how we got started working together. But, um, but that's, really, that's really how it went down. Um, You're making me blush, man. Because yeah. uh, that's actually hearing it from you, uh, the story about Lewis. Yeah. I mean, I have the utmost respect for Lewis. And I was working with the Oakley Big Bass Tour. And mm-hmm. That's how I got to know Lewis. And I got to know some of the guys at like Quantum. And and I guess there, there were another company right. that you talked to. Yep. Lewis Bob Bagby and, and John Kushnarik both. Yeah. Lewis, to have his seal of approval, that's that's a big deal. Yeah. Well, you know, Lewis, to me, um, you, you have a few people in your life that that come into your life at a certain time and really teach you something. Yeah. So during the great outdoor games, um, I went fishing in, in New York of all places and I'm trout fishing in New York and, and I look over at this guy that I'm fishing with and he's got these glasses on and I said, what kind of glasses are those? He said, they, these are Oakley's. They're the frog skin. I don't know if you remember the frog skin. It was, I know their, frog first, skin. It was their first pair of polarized glasses and they kind of looked like Varnays. They were like, you know, yeah, yeah, different, yeah. different Real style. kind of like wide. Not really a fishing style. Yeah. And, um, I was like, really, let me see those. So I put them on and I was like, man, I'm calling them when I get back. <laughs> so, um, I didn't have any sort of sunglass sponsor and I really liked the Oakley glasses. So I, I called them and, and Lewis, um, was, was my guy. That's who yeah. I got in touch with. And, and the first thing he said to me, he said, uh, uh, well, I'll be happy to talk to you, but fishing really isn't on TV too much, is it? Yeah. And I said, well. Actually, actually it is. And actually, I just was in this this thing called the ESPN Great Outdoor Games. It was in, it was on ABC and it was on ESPN and it was in front of 17 million people and I happened to win. And he was like, "Really? I didn't know that it, that it was on TV that much." And he goes, "Well, here's what you need to do. You need to just send me an email on everything that you're doing." And I said, you just want me to send an email on everything I'm doing? And he said, yeah, you just, you just go ahead and just write down whatever you're doing, send me an email. And so Lewis became my journal. Yeah. I mean, these emails to Lewis became, became, I don't know why I felt so open about doing this with him, but I, he, he, he assured me, he's like, look, man, I want to know everything you're doing. And if we have any future together, you need to tell me everything that you're doing. And I was like, okay. So I'd do a radio interview. I'd come home and I'm like, Lewis, 
did a radio interview today, talked about, you know, this and this and this, and, and it was on this, this, you know, radio station in the Florida Keys. And then this one, I did one with ESPN and then this and this. And so I'm writing down all this stuff. And over the, over the years, I look back on those days and him telling me, you know, well, that's great that you did that, but it really doesn't help me at all. Yeah. Yeah. This over here that you did and you didn't think was helping anything, this free seminar that you did. Now that is really good. You mm-hmm. need to keep doing more things like that. But what, what happened with my time with Lewis is that he, he really taught me that you can go and do anything that you want to, but if you don't tell your sponsors about it, it really ha- has no, no benefit to them. You know, that's something that Lewis taught me a lot too. And, but at the time when I, when I first met him, I was real green. Yeah. Uh, and too. I still am. I mean, <laughs> I, we, I guess we all are really, you know, we're, we're all learning, but Lewis automatically just struck me as somebody like, I need to listen to this guy. Like, and he's, he's actually listening to me and he's, he's higher up on uh, the Oakley, you know, staff. And so he started telling me this, about the same things that, that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wish I utilized that communication more. I see that that was a mistake. I'm kind of a perfectionist, you know, and that can, that can be one of the, your biggest struggles with a lot of different things that you do, whether it's social media content or, or uh, just anything you do for, for sponsors, because I would be like, oh, you know, I did this little seminar. I was only like 20 people there. Yeah. I don't think Lewis wants to know about that. Over the time, I kind of regret not communicating more with him about the, the little things because he, he's willing, he was willing to, to listen and yeah. he was willing to give me advice based on you know, my progress. Yeah. Well, I think in sponsorship, it's important to let everyone know what you're doing. And mm-hmm. today it's easier than ever with social media. But if you're doing a seminar with 20 people, there's nothing to be ashamed of. No, there's about not. About doing a seminar Absolutely with not. 20 people. There are a lot of guys that don't do a seminar with 20 people in their entire career. Yeah. Like that's certainly nothing to be ashamed of. In some seminars, you're going to have 20 people and some (laughs) seminars you're going to have 200 people. And some of the ones that you're going to have two or three people show up, those are actually the most important because those guys are going to go on and say, Hey, you know, I was at this just random sports show and you see that guy on TV right there. I saw, I, I was at a sports show and I sat there and talked to him for 45 minutes about knots. And he just sat there and talked to me, right? Like that's what a lot of people will remember. And you can actually turn somebody's fishing career around. You can turn whatever around, or you can just be a decent guy and spend a little time with somebody, answer a few questions. Yep. But you know, those are the things that that sponsors often are very, very interested in. And and Lewis also gave me a piece of advice. And I think it was Lewis, maybe it was Shaw Grigsby. I don't know, both of those guys <laughs> at the same time. It's hard to get Lewis and Shaw Grigsby. Confused, mixed up <laughs> but but at the time both of them were equally as as uh influential on my on my fishing career you are worth your audience you are yeah. you are worth the size of your audience and um that's something that always stuck with me and so back then it was before the internet it was before social media or anything like that certainly before websites even that so i just said okay well if i need to increase my audience i need more customers on the boat I need to write articles. I need to take photographs. I need to do free seminars. I need to do paid seminars. I need to do tournaments. I need to do all of these things. Yep. Every one of those things was a way of, of creating a larger audience. Yeah. Today, there's even more ways to create a larger audience. And some people are really super good at it. Some people are, uh, are not as good at it. But, but today, there's more and more ways. Each of them is, is important and influential to yes. the sponsorship. But yeah, I learned a lot about Lewis, um, or I learned a lot from Lewis, even another thing that we may get into it later, but, uh, (laughs) fishing with Lewis, I learned a lesson about myself 15 years after it had, after this event had happened, I learned a lesson about myself that, that brought a lot of things very clear. I'll tell you about it another time, but very interesting. Good times back then. So Miles, tell us about where do you come from? How do you end up sitting on this couch right here talking to us? Man, what a story. Talking to me. You know, it's, it's amazing how, you know, life works. And if you really want something, how it happens, as long as you just keep yourself in it, right. keep the pressure on, and it just kind of develops. It's not exactly the plan that you want it to be because, you know, it, it's, it, it's unpredictable. But in the end, it's 
it, it kind of is exactly where you want to be. Um, but it, essentially, you know, when I was uh, to start at the very beginning, grew up down in the, the Florida Keys. That's where I loved to learn how to, to love to fish. Yeah. Marathon. Hmm. And so cool. did some saltwater fishing down there. Yeah. I loved it down there. Now wait, why, why were you in the Florida Keys? What, what brought your my, family to the Florida? My Keys? dad bought a house down there. He just liked to, to live in Florida. And, and so we moved down there. And so this is, this is your dad's retired at this point. He is, he is retired. That was way after the show. So it, for the listeners that don't know, my dad, my dad played a uh, radar on mash. Yeah. Uh, my nickname's Sonar. That's <laughs> radar that's and Sonar. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Son of radar. And so after mash, you know, he, he wanted to retire down there. And so we, we moved down there. It didn't end up being his, his end location, but, um, it, it sure did give me a start in, in, uh, fishing. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely just, I was ate up with it, man. And then after that, we actually have a house in Connecticut. So we'd go up there and, and that was on a freshwater lake. And I remember catching my very first bass. It was a beautiful <laughs> thing, man. At least I think it was my first bass. You know, when you're little, you may have caught some more, but there was one that really just stuck with me. It was a smallmouth bass and I had this little lure that they used to sell at this, this tackle shop called Nickel Sporting Goods. It was essentially this plastic a lure that had a little pull string. So when you cast it out, these little legs would clap together on the what? surface. Yeah, I know, really? And it was it was awesome. And I, I mean, I got a kick out of that. But I remember casting that thing out there and the thing went to work, you know, and it was shaking its legs. And then uh, all of a sudden, this just giant explosion. And when you're a kid, it's just anything's big. Yeah. And uh, it ended up being like a, a three pound smallmouth bass. And it was like the coolest thing. And ever since then, I mean, I threw all the Dorado, all the Wahoo and stuff that I was catching with my dad offshore in the Keys. And I was like, I want to go b- tournament bass fish. Or, you know, at that time, it was just bass fishing. Right. And then I learned of tournaments. And so I've been tournament fishing, you know, since high school and decided to move back to Florida, go to school in Florida. I picked a school based on the, its proximity to lakes that I want to fish. <laughs> and then, uh, and then just, you know, I just, I had it in my mind that I was going to achieve my dream of becoming a professional fisherman. And I moved into a trailer during that whole college year, uh, you know, eight year period. So I could stay close to, uh, I could keep my overhead low stay close to the lakes that I wanted to fish and, uh, and kind of have focus. You know, I didn't want to be out partying all the time, which would have been nice. It, it was, it was actually a, a kind of, I had some lonely periods, but <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah. but it worked out in the long run. That was like the, the best experience. And, and just the simple act of, of continuing to put that pressure on and stay out there and, and continue to, to network with people, you know, I'd go to the Bassmaster Classic. I'd wear the best clothes that I could possibly afford because I knew that I'd stand out against all these other guys that mm-hmm. are that are going to these these trade shows and they're just wearing sneakers and stuff. And I knew that I'd look a, a just different than the, the the other guys that were approaching them, young young guys. And so I just kept on going to these shows. I'd get to meet people, and then uh, that just you know started. I started building relationships and it it wasn't like I was sending these applications off for sponsorships. It just, it just kind of organically happened because mm-hmm. they saw that I was there. I was willing to work. I knew the hustle. I was trying hard. And so, um, and then sooner or later, I got a call from a guy named Mark Jones. He's, he, uh, him and, and a, a guy named, uh, Keith Odom, they run the Oakley big bass tour, which is yeah. now the, the, uh, the, the, uh, bass pro shops, big bass tour. They had got my name from somebody else. They wanted me to to host their show for, and they, I did it for two years, and that's where I met. That's where I met Lewis, <laughs> and then Lewis, you know, got me in touch with you, right? And so it just comes full circle, and it's a beautiful thing because it's like, you know, you work so hard all these years to to uh, um, you know get someplace, and it's and it's not exactly where you think you're going to be. I actually thought that I didn't want to have my own fishing show. Like, I was just like, I just want to focus on tournaments. I don't want to be, to have my focus, you know, split up between several different things. I want to, you know, go tournament fishing. Right. That's it. And then all of a sudden I get these opportunities and I find out something in myself that I'm just like, I really enjoy this. Yeah. You know? And so it's, it's really cool how it works. Yeah. That's, uh, that's funny. I want to talk about the sponsorship thing Mm -hmm. because one thing that I run into all the time and probably I, I would say, of the top three subjects that I, I receive messages on, 
emails or questions when we're at a sports show or whatever revolve around sponsorship, mm -hmm. revolve around someone who wants to get to a certain place, feels like sponsorship is necessary, has no idea how to get there. And, you know, sometimes there's just not enough time to really, to really put towards giving someone the information that they really need, right? I want to because it's good for that person, usually a kid, I want to because it's good for the industry. Mm -hmm. It's good for the sponsors that I work with. One thing that I run into a lot of times are individuals who feel as though they've caught some fish. They're pretty good. Yeah. They maybe won a tournament or two and they deserve sponsorship. Wrong. Right. That's what I think. It's yeah. Wrong. Yeah. Dead, dead wrong. No, absolutely. And, and it was a hard lesson for me to learn and it happened during the time that we were fishing in the redfish tournament. So our tournament experience starts in the Florida Keys where it's a different type of tournament. It's, it's a guide who gets booked by a tournament. Yeah. These tournaments started as a way to fill in some slow time for the guides, right? So a September tournament is generally a very, very slow time. So mm -hmm. they, they started doing these tournaments that would bring anglers to the Keys to, to have some fun, to fish in a tournament, and then the guide gets a little work. It also happens to be a charity event, which was a beautiful thing. Cystic fibrosis, the red bone tournaments, mm -hmm. raised huge amounts of money for, for cystic fibrosis. It was a wonderful thing. And it also happens at a time where that's, that's your sonar going off. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Thought I'd turn uh, that off. It, it actually sounds like sonar. I like yeah, it. Well, it, it's uh, by design. Anyway, these these tournaments would happen at a time where it was really good for the guides. It, it 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 injects money into the local economy. But basically, it is two guys fishing on the front of a boat, a guide on the back of the boat, skiff tournaments mm -hmm. mostly, and it's really designed to raise money for charity and and give these guys a an opportunity to fish. Give, yeah. the, give the guide an opportunity to work well, just like any other type of a, a thing that ha starts that way. Yeah. It becomes competitive very, very quickly, very right? Quickly. Like, you, you know, it's a reputation thing. You don't win money, but you win, you win a reputation. So if you are constantly the guy that is winning those things, you are going to end up getting a little bit more of an audience. This mm -hmm. is before the internet, you know, when this is all happening, like I was saying. So it was an excellent way for your name to be at the top of that scoreboard if you had anglers that could fish. Mm -hmm. So that's one type of tournament. Then that, then we graduate to another type of tournament, which is a professional caliber tournament, more like what you're used to fishing in, where you're fishing for money and you're moving around. And that was in the redfish tournament. So in these redfish tournaments, I learned my lesson about sponsorship in that it was definitely not about how many tournaments you win. If you win tournaments, that is excellent. But what is the most important is putting on an absolute positive impression for whoever it is that you represent absolutely and that positive impression comes in a lot of different ways the the condition of your gear you know how clean is your truck you know are you driving like a madman down the road with all these sponsor people all over your car or are you being 100 percent professional are you saying hello to every little kid that you see are you waiting in line patiently at the boat ramp? Mm -hmm. Are you doing free seminars during the tournament? Are you doing them before the tournament? Are you doing them after the tournament? And it became really, really obvious to me that an angler who never wins a tournament, but does a lot of free seminars or yes. paid seminars or writes articles is way more valuable than a guy that wins a few tournaments here and there. And I think that's a very tough thing to get across to someone who feels like, man, well, Kevin Van Dam gets sponsored because he wins all these tournaments. Yeah. True. But he's he's one of the hardest working guys, if not the hardest I, working guy in the bass yeah. bass industry. Maybe even just fishing in general. I believe it. I I know Kevin and he's a he's I don't know him very well, but I know him by reputation and I've run into him at many quantum events where where you know we're sponsored by a number of the same sponsors and we mm -hmm. have run into one another. And I'm always very impressed with his work ethic. That's what everyone always says about Kevin. And what Kevin also will impress you with right away, he's a humble guy. Real he humble. is never going to walk past someone with his head held high and doesn't have time for this guy. That, Which the, He's the most sponsored fisherman because he always has time for someone. Here's, here's my perspective on the whole sponsor thing. And I've 
learn the hard way like everybody else has. My perspective is that as anglers, if you want to make a living as a professional angler, quote unquote, you have to be uh, in the mindset that you're an ambassador, period. You're not a tournament angler because nobody wants to pay you just to, to go fish tournaments. They're paying you to be an ambassador for the sport, get people excited about fishing, teach them how to fish. And in turn, that's going to help the industry. It's there. People are going to buy product and go fishing. Yeah. And that's exactly what you, you need to do. And you do that through seminars. You do it through writing. It's just whatever it is. Nowadays, it's social media. Social media is the big thing. Getting people excited. You, you always want to have a positive attitude about everything that you do. Spin everything in a positive. I mean, because yeah. you don't want to turn anybody off. You don't want to be negative about it. Sponsors don't like that. No, they're, nobody likes that. They're right? in this business to, to, to make money. It's business. And there's nothing that in the, in the, the company handbook that says that they have to sponsor somebody. No. They could put their money somewhere else. And the reason that, that, they, that sponsorship is uh, something that the companies do, and they do put a substantial amount of budget towards, is because anglers are the only real platform to get other anglers excited about fishing and bring more people into the sport and, and buy more product. And so that's, that's one thing, one thing I always, cause I get the same question, you know, I, with the limited success that I've had and it keeps on growing and I'm real humbled by it. I get a lot of questions about sponsorship. And first thing I tell somebody is don't worry about it. Don't worry about sponsorship right now. Focus on fishing because when you're, when you enjoy what you do, people are going to notice, right? Go, focus on fishing first, networking second. Networking's huge. Staying professional and just meeting people. Don't don't be soliciting for sponsorships all over the place because the most meaningful sponsorships and the most meaningful partnerships. Getting your own show, um, uh, you know, with with Joey, of course, you know, right. you guys approaching me. That all happened organically. I didn't send you guys an application for you know for Sweetwater. No. It it just happened because. I, I I realized that I just need to focus on my fishing and enjoying uh, what I'm doing and and providing a very positive atmosphere for the people around me. Right. And and you know, uh, well well the reason that that something like that happens in my opinion is because you paid your dues. Mm -hmm. You had been paying your dues for many many years, so that when that opportunity does happen, like flipping cards on a deck, when that card comes up you're the first person that anybody thinks about. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, and, and, and obviously there's some serendipity or some, some, uh, you know, networking is excellent. You know, Lewis, I know Lewis, Lewis, I ask Lewis, I, I'm thinking enough about, about this project that I start asking everybody I know, who yeah. do you recommend? Well, I got your name from two different people. So obviously you've been putting your work in and, you know, you weren't expecting anything, but that's what happens is because you were just doing it out of love for the sport. You were doing it because you're, you're trying to be a professional at this and your name comes up twice. And certainly then there's one more step, right? That, that you actually have to, we have to get together. And then all of the things that I hear have to be consistent with what I see. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And, and that's exactly what happened. So I, I'm really glad it did because I've really enjoyed me too. Really, um, enjoyed working, um, with both you and, and Joey, and we've created something pretty cool. I think, I think, uh, I, with Sweetwater. The Sweetwater is, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I'm so happy that you gave me that, <laughs> sent me that email. I was, I remember when I was, I was driving to the bank, driving my wife to the bank, we we're dropping off the rent and I saw your, your, your email. I'm like, Tom Rowland, who's Tom Rowland? And I looked you up on, on, uh, on the internet cause I'm not a saltwater guy. So <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know the great Tom Rowland. And then, uh, and then I flew back to Alabama and we met for the first time and I was pretty nervous taking you out fishing and we really <laughs> sucked. <laughs> we didn't catch much of anything, no. but you know, I'm glad that I made a good first impression. Nah, it was, it was good. And it was, you know, and, and, um, and, and so that was great, but you know, the, what do you think the hardest thing about shooting a TV show is? The hard, the hardest thing is by far leaving when the fish are biting. Yeah, <laughs> because because you're not you catch as many fish as you need for the show, and then you go do some some you know post some B roll or you know something else. You do some 
tips or or something. Yeah. And it, for example, we were we were just down at Toledo Bend uh, last year and and uh, filming a kayak episode, and we got on a, the most amazing shallow water uh, bass fishing bite. It was <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And then as soon as we caught enough fish for the show, uh, the you know the 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 camera guy, you know, the, our producer just said we're done. And he's just like, we're, we're good. Let's go in. We're like, no, <laughs> it's, it, it's like, it's so painful to leave fish when they're, when they're biting like that. But you know, that's, that's just, uh, that's just how it goes, but that's a good problem to have. I mean, it's not always like right. that film in a show because you essentially, you know, on a regular fishing day, if you catch 10 fish on a filming day, you're only going to catch about two probably. Yeah. I'd say. Well, tell why. Why is that? Well, number one, I you know, know why that is. Yeah, you <laughs> you know too well. Well, you're a saltwater guy, so you got all kinds of stuff biting. You throw a shrimp in the water, and pretty much anything. Sometimes, will be, no, yeah. that's every Sometimes time. Sometimes you're right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got a uh, blue shoot going on right now, and there's a lot of shrimp going in the water, and nothing's biting them. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, the the first thing is is there's a lot of moving parts when you're filming a show. And so you've got the camera, you've got, we've got three camera guys and a photographer on most shoots. And so we're trying to uh, make sure that everybody's got the camera rolling. The batteries aren't, aren't dead. And sometimes the fish are schooling on the surface and, and you can't make a cast. You yeah. just can't make a cast until all those cameras are up, or at least the majority of them are. And so that's really tough because you're you're essentially wasting a lot of time. What quote unquote wasting? I mean, it's obvious that we're uh, we're producing some some good shows, some good footage, but it's uh, it, you know it, it is frustrating because it takes a long time. It's a it's a process, and and over time, I mean, this third year, I've kind of learned to kind of tone down a little bit, just kind of be there, and just be ready to go fishing when when the cameras are up. Yeah. You learn some patience. Yeah, you, you you definitely learn patience. And so the bass fishing show is definitely different than the saltwater shows, but there's also a tremendous amount of similarities there. And so we got into shooting saltwater experience immediately on the heels of having some success in the redfish tournaments, mm -hmm. which is very similar to the bass fishing. Man, the fish are there. You better catch them because they're probably not going to be there in just a minute or this guy's going to pull in on you and catch yeah. them. And those are probably the winning fish. So, you know, it's, it's hurry, 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 catch fish, go as fast as you can to get there. And, and then, you know, as soon the, the second that you feel like this is not happening out, you're gone yeah. because otherwise, otherwise you you are actually wasting time. Whereas the television show, man, we learned pretty close, pretty, pretty quickly that, it's not about catching a lot of fish. No. It's about covering one fish really well. And if you go and get ahead of the camera boat and catch a world record, it does not matter and it does not count. Yeah. So what <laughs> we had to do was, was to, all of a sudden it started making sense to us. When he said it doesn't, when, when Hop, our producer, says, if you go out, away from us and you catch a world record it doesn't count that really hit home with me because i went okay well that's just like if we're in a redfish tournament and we catch one that's 30 of, inches yeah. and the slot is is uh you know 27 inches doesn't and you catch matter. one that's 28 it doesn't matter if he weighs 15 pounds it doesn't count yeah so we put it all into tournament kind of into a tournament perspective of okay look the camera has to be there or there, but they have to give us the thumbs up and then we can catch them. And when we do catch them with that thumb up, that means it counted. Yeah. So that's what we're after. And if we go real fast and we break all the cameras and beat up all the camera guys, then it doesn't count. So the idea is we've got to go real slow. We've got to get there. We've got to let the cameras get in the right position. <laughs> And then we have to catch the fish. I know that and, feeling so yeah, much yeah, now. Yeah, it's it's harder, but you know, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's just something that you have to learn, and 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 it it doesn't come quickly. And even no. even we're thirteen years into this, and still you see a tailor a little bit further down there, you immediately start after it. Yeah. You know? And and what we've learned though 
yeah, over over time is that if you are super patient, these fish will allow you to do things that you never thought were possible. Mm -hmm. And some of those things have resulted in some of the best shows that we've ever filmed and obviously some of the best Sweetwater shows that, that have ever been filmed as well. And that is something like seeing a tailing fish or a school of fish in some way, shape, or form, realizing that the light is not good from where you are right now or where the camera guy is. And the camera guy says, you know what would be great? is if we were on the other side of that fish <laughs> and you're like, well, you can't do that. Why? Well, you're going to scare them away. Well, we've already got enough fish for the show. So let's just try this. And you're, you know, the fisherman sitting there going, this is never, ever going to work. So I'm just going to sit down and eat a sandwich and you guys go around there. And then you tell me if the fish is there. And so they go way around very slowly. And then they go, Hey, he's still here doing the same thing. <laughs> what? Really? And so now we've gotten the camera on the other side of the fish and then we approach slowly, throw, you know, right into the sun. They're looking on the other side of the fish, looking down sun, perfect light right at us. And those are some of the best shows, the best shots we've ever gotten and, and doing things. That's why I like to have a producer who is not necessarily a fisherman. Yeah. For that reason. He's looking for art. He's looking at the light and he's saying, look, man, we can shoot it like this, but it's going to be, it's going to look like every other fishing show out there. Yeah. If you want this thing to be really great, we need to approach from the other side. Well, that's going to be really hard to do. Well, I'm just telling you how to make a great show, man. That's, <laughs> that's how the, that's how the conversation goes around our shoot. And then we're like, okay, well, you know what? We want to make a great show. So we're going to try this. Yeah. With all expectation that it's going to fail. And you know what? A lot of most Sometimes of the times it works, it works actually. <laughs> it's kind of weird. It, you know, uh, we have the same experience on, on uh, Sweetwater. It's, it's like sometimes we question our professional, you know, yeah. uh, quality, you know, it, it, I, I think probably peyote does because he's, he's just like, well, you just do, go over there and, you know, throw a frog. I'm just like, no, man, it's, they're not going to hit a frog. And they hit a frog. Yeah, but maybe they will. Yeah. And if they will, it'll be awesome. Yeah. But don't you find that, um, that, you know, I find that as, as a fishing guide and as a television host and as just a regular angler and as a tournament fisherman, each one of these things has made me a better angler and a better, you know, a more complete angler. Because first of all, in a tournament, you're operating with time restriction. restrictions, you're, yeah. you're time restricted. You are restricted on the type of tackle that you can use. Yep. You're restricted on whether or not you can use live bait in some tournaments. You're restricted on, you know, can you put a triple hook rig on there? I don't know. You're, you're restricted. There are yes. rules. Yeah. There are always rules. So when you come around those rules and you, 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 you are successful within those rules, yeah. you have done something that you might not have done on another day. If you were on a regular guide trip, maybe you would have used live bait. If you were, or maybe you would have used an umbrella rig mm -hmm. that was legally within the law, mm -hmm. but not in that tournament, right? Yeah. Like maybe, maybe, I don't know, there's a, there, there may be a tournament where you can't fly fish yeah, or yeah. you could fly fish or you can't. And a lot of times in the, in the keys, we'll have tournaments that, um, chumming is allowed in one tournament. Chumming is not allowed yeah. in another tournament. Live bait is allowed in one tournament. It's not allowed in another tournament. So you get in that tournament and you have to just get in that frame of mind of, okay, well, we're fly fishing all day in this tournament. That's yeah. what we're doing. Okay. So if you're successful in that, you're successful in ways that you might not have thought were possible in other ways. When you are on a guide trip, you are hit severely restricted sometimes by the skill level of your angler or the yeah. experience level of your angler. But then you get that person to catch a very, very difficult fish. And it's this feeling, this euphoric feeling of, wow, I overcame the situation. Yeah. And now we've been successful. And in the television world, it is, okay, now I am dragging around one, if not two other boats, all of these people slamming hatches, yeah. cooler lids slamming. It's loud. And they're telling me that I can't fish the way that I need to fish to catch these fish. Yeah. But I'm going to do what they say. We're going to take their suggestions and then we're still going to be successful. And when, when those things happen, it just makes me sit back and sometimes mostly it's a humbling situation going, yeah. man. I really thought I knew about this situation. I really thought I knew what yeah. was going on here. But obviously, there are a lot of other ways to 
yeah. <laughs> to skin a cat. It really, it really does open up your eyes to, to, um, you know, the, a different, you know, the one thing that I think that I've taken away from film and Sweetwater is that I think I'm a more intuitive angler because of it. And I think that's so important. And it, it seems because, intuitive how? because we're so far behind the curve when it comes to the amount of time that we're able to, to fish and how many casts we can get in. You uh, mean you don't always leave the dock at 4, 4 a.m.? Yeah, <laughs> we, we do, but the, <laughs> we, we call it the, crack, but the ca- cameras don't get up till 8. <laughs> we call it the crack of noon fishing team. Yeah, pretty much. Is, that's, that's how it goes. But what that forces you to do is you have to use your strengths yes. and focus on your strengths. You can't just start doing some funky stuff that you, uh, that you read about in a magazine or a, 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 you know, a book somewhere. Uh, it, it's no time to, to really experiment um, and in many cases you can, but what it forces you to do is it, it forces you to take out a lot of the science out of it, yeah. which it's, that sounds like it's it kind of counterintuitive, but really fish are very instinctual. I mean, that's, that's all they have is their instincts. Mm-hmm. That's what dictates their habits. And once you kind of make things kind of simple and kind of focus on, on the, the simple tactics and your strengths, it seems to work out a whole lot better. Like if you if you watch Sweetwater, you notice that I throw a chatterbait a lot. Yeah, that's your thing. Throwing chatterbaits, I, it is my thing because it works and I know it. And I, I know how many different circumstances I can throw that thing in and and catch fish. And that's that's the thing is that I think that 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 uh, filming has made fishing more simple for me. I'm not making it, it, it more difficult, which is so important. I think, and I take that for my tournament fishing. I, I end up, uh, you know, uh, before I've, the worst tournaments I've had, I've overthought it. I've ended up, ended up, um, uh, you know, doing something that I'm not very comfortable with it too technical, you know, something that, that say Kevin Van Dam, he's really good at throwing deep diving crankbaits. I'm not good at th- throwing deep diving crankbaits, but that lake is known for winning with deep diving crankbaits. If I try to do that, I'm competing against somebody else right. and not the fish. So I just focus on my, my strengths and, uh, and the show has really br- made me uh, remember that because when I first started really doing well in tournaments, I started making a name for myself. That's what I was doing. I was doing the things that I enjoyed to do the most and could do better than most anybody else. Mm-hmm. I wasn't venturing off into, you know, un, uh, uncharted territory as far as techniques and, and fishing styles. I was focusing on what, what I enjoyed to do. And, and the same thing with, with a Sweetwater. I've tried, you know, being under the gun and, and trying, uh, you know, techniques that Joey likes to throw, you know, mm-hmm. like a drop shot or something like that. And I can't throw a drop shot like Joey can. And, and maybe Joey can't throw a, a chatterbait like I can. So it's like, you just got to fish your strengths and kind of keep it simple. That's what I've kind of taken away from, from uh, filming Sweetwater. And it has really helped me on the tournament trail. Hmm. Yeah. Well, focusing on your strengths, the strengths really, you know, I don't know. The the more I learn about fishing, the more I realize I really don't know much about fishing at all. And um, I think that's the I think that's the educational cycle. You get to a place where you feel like you really got this thing licked, man. You you know it, man, inside yeah. and out. And there are no tricks that you don't know. And the next thing you know, something happens, and you realize, holy moly, I don't really know anything about this. Like, yeah. I'm going to have to rethink everything. <laughs> And so as I, as I've gotten a little bit older and certainly have more and more experience, I realize, man, I don't know that I know anything about, uh, about fishing. And there's a tremendous amount of different ways that you can get to the same result of catching the fish. Yes. You can do it from, you know, like you're saying, like Joey does and what you do, you could never convince me that you two guys or guys like Scott Walker and Steve Roger or guys like me and Rich that well certainly not 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 you and Joey. Now I'm not I'm not an expert bass fisherman, but I've fished around you guys and fished with you guys enough to know both of you can handle a rod very well. Mm-hmm. So you would have a hard time convincing me that Joey can't throw a chatterbait like you or you can't throw a drop shot like him. To me what it boils down to you don't have the confidence in the drop shot like he does. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have the confidence in the chatterbait like you do. So you're going to fish it differently, the, harder, stick with it longer. Yes. 
Yeah. And 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 maybe maybe okay. Well, it's not working here. I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to get it deeper. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that with it because you have the confidence. Yes, it's not the rod skill. It's not. No, it's, it, it, it's, has, it has nothing to do with technical skill. It all it, all it is is the fact that the, that very subtle differences in presentation is what makes or breaks a pattern or you know a bite. Yeah, and and when it comes to building upon your strengths, it's anybody can flip and pitch, you know, just as good as, you know, <laughs> anybody else, you know, mm-hmm. at the pro circuit, everybody's pretty much on an even play in the field as, as far as uh, technical skill. Um, but it's, it's, it's all the mental game. You know, it's, it, I've, I've noticed a distinct difference in the way that I, I retrieve, uh, I'll use the chatterbait as an example again, Retrieve a chatterbait when I know I'm going to get a bite. <laughs> There's yeah. a distinct difference, and and I I'm getting the bite because I know I'm going to get the bite. It's kind of right. you know, but if if I don't have confidence in it, I don't have the experience with you know the, how that that bait feels and what the fish are really um, you know focusing on as far as the retrieve goes, then I'm probably not going to do very good with it. Right. Well, uh, and like I say, I think I think that a tremendous amount of that. Boils down to confidence, how long you're willing to stick with it. That yeah. if you're willing to stick with it longer, you're learning those subtle, those yes. subtle things. You are, you are saying, you know, I've been through this before. Five more casts, we'll see what happens. Where somebody else that doesn't have the confidence in it, it's a new lure to them. It's a new, it's a new technique. It's a new way of fishing that lure. Maybe they don't stick with it long enough to to get that one bump. To, yeah. To to where oh, if I slow it down a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah, now I've got it. And it's the same thing in saltwater. It's the same thing with with different types of baits. It's the same thing with 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 all of that. But it it does boil down to the to the confidence, and that's that's really so much of what fishing is. And that is the one consistent thing that I have that I keep going back to as I as I say that you know I learn one thing and then I realize I don't know anything. What I do know is that is that fishing is about confidence. It's about being confident in your yeah. gear and your in your technique and in, in in your surroundings in the area, whatever. It's about that. And if you have that confidence, you can make some amazing things happen yeah. in some very poor, poor conditions. Yeah. I've, I've, my experience with confidence, confidence is, is, it's a funny thing because I, I feel like sometimes a confidence is misused and it can be misused and it can be a negative. How do you uh, for, misuse confidence? For, you for, stay with something when it's for, obviously for not insta- working? Well, for instance, uh, a lot of people say they have a confidence color. Or a confidence bait. When you put confidence in a object that you know, like color or the actual bait, mm-hmm. you're limiting your potential. You have to have confidence in your ability to choose that bait, to mm-hmm. choose that color. And once you have that that confidence, that's much more broad and that allows you to, you know, perform in in different different conditions. That's how you properly use confidence. Mm-hmm. But when you put it in something that, that you know, it, like, like a, a certain little bait that you've caught a lot of fish on, you know, I've seen it time and time again. The confidence baits that I used to have in the past would fail during the tournament for, yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that in, in not only just the baits that you're using and the techniques that you're using, but also, you know, one of the common things in the Florida Keys were for guys to get on them a milk route where they fish this spot and this spot yeah. and this spot and, and the fishing is no good. Fishing history, right? Yeah. They, they just, no, nah, fishing is no good today. Yeah. But, you know, they never got outside of their milk route. They never, yeah, yeah. they never, they never uh, experienced something different. And if they had, maybe they would have seen something different. But I was, you know, all of this <clears throat> stuff that you're talking about obviously comes from a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of experience in a lot of different lakes. Yes. So you lived in California for mm-hmm. a little while. Now you're moving back to Florida. Where where do you find your confidence area is, and where do you, where is the easiest place for you to fish? Florida, Florida is the easiest way. Okeechobee, is that because of uh, of your college experience, you went to college. In yeah, Orlando. I went to UCF, and uh, man, it took me a long time to figure out Florida. I moved there specifically because if you look at the tournament trail. The, the tournaments always start in Florida in January or February. It's like Louisiana and, for us in the it, Redfish tournaments. Yeah. That's and, the hot spot. Yeah. And the, the, the tour pros either hate Florida or they absolutely love it. And some of the biggest bombs that, that people have, like that's where, the, that's where the leaderboard really takes a hit. 
is is Florida generally. And so I was just like, you know, I need to figure that out because having good momentum starting the year, it's really important. So I need to go down there and learn Florida. So I moved down there. And I think the reason why I feel so comfortable in Florida, it, it does. I just, I just got back from living in California for a few years and I, I got back to Florida and I jumped right back into it. I mean, I didn't miss a beat. I've enjoyed myself. Um, and I've caught a lot of fish and, and, and cashed quite a few checks so far. And, uh, and the reason for that is that I didn't go fishing with other people when I first moved to Florida. It, I didn't fish with my first person in Florida for uh, until like the fourth year I was there. Hmm. Literally did not go fishing with anybody for four years. I had a lot of really down you know, days, a lot of them. I mean, a ton. I was, I wasn't catching any big fish. I wasn't doing good in any tournaments, but then all of a sudden I started because of all my experience that I, you know, my experience, not somebody on the back of the boat's experience or another person's experience, because I was that, that kind of loner kid that didn't know anybody. I had these experiences so I could, I could know the little intricacies of, of what was going on at that particular moment, which is really important. Those little, those little details, um, you know, that's why doc talk can be so dangerous is yeah. because the, how somebody else caught a fish, there's something very, very small that they did to, to catch that fish. And so what I learned by just fishing by myself is I learned how to trust my own instincts. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer, maybe I'm a little bit too holistic with my, my thought process in, in, in fishing, but I'm a big believer in instinctual angling, going out there and just listening to your gut instinct um, and just kind of fishing that moment. You build an instinct over time. You don't, you're, not, right. you're not grown with, you know, you're not born with it. You grow it over time and you grow it by your own experiences, period. Right. Nobody else's experience. So don't you think when you're saying that to somebody that is getting started in this it's frustrating and building those experiences, of course it's frustrating, but but as you build a wider base, it's just like building a building, you know? Yeah. You can have a building that looks like a pyramid that's gonna stand the test of time, wide base, and yeah. you know, and build up from there. Or you can you can build a skyscraper that's very, very thin on the bottom. And what I mean by that, and it's the same thing in salt water, is you can either choose to build this instinct like you're talking about yeah. through a, a select few techniques and a select few lakes and a select few spots in salt water. Yeah. Or you can choose to build that instinct with a tremendous amount. Yeah. Of techniques, skills, rods. I know people that don't know how to fish with a spinning rod. I know yeah. people that don't know how to, how to throw a, a fly rod. I know people that don't know how to throw a bait caster, right? All of them are tools to me, like a golf yes. bag. I, I want to be an expert with every single one. Yes. I want to be able to look at a bass fisherman's tackle box and say, man, I can catch redfish on that. I can catch tarpon on that. I know how to fish this. Wow. I wonder what they do with that. I could probably, if a bass will eat it, I'm sure I can find a fish that yeah. will eat it. And so I want to be able to, one, one of the things that would help me to develop that instinct and help me to do, do better in the tournaments and as a fishing guide is to embrace all of the techniques, to yes. embrace all of the spots, to learn all of the Florida Keys. And you know what? The only way to do that is to have the dry days, to go out with the fly rod or yeah. go out with the the bait caster or the spinning rod if you're not familiar with spin casting or or whatever the fairy rod whatever bass fisherman call it and and go out and try it yeah right and you've got to have the dry days you've got to have those days where you're not catching anything and it's really frustrating yeah. but if you embrace all of those techniques yeah i feel like you're building a wider base you have more experience to draw from yeah i i agree i i i feel that um you know, when I was first learning, I was absorbing everything. I was, I was taking all the magazines. I had a massive collection of it, magazines. My, my truck couldn't tow my, my trailer specifically because of my magazine collection. <laughs> I actually had to leave it at one RV resort so I could move it to another one. I, <laughs> I, I slept with my magazines pretty much. And so I had all these books and magazines. magazines are these we're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Bassmaster, <laughs> yeah. fish porn. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I absorbed all of that. And so I learned a lot of different techniques, everything I could. If there was a new technique, I learned it. Mm-hmm. But the thing that I also learned over time that has really helped me is that there's some techniques that I need to pick and choose. Like there's, there's certain, there's certain techniques that I'm beating a dead horse with mm. personally. It's not my style. I'm a, I'm a shallow water power fisherman and I've learned to really embrace that. And I tell you what, I, I have way more, uh, you know, checks when I do that mm-hmm. than, uh, than when I don't, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I guess if you were to, if you were to see that, that that's your strength and you were going to attack your weakness, then the way to, the way to do that, which is something that you've already said that you did was you kind of afraid of Florida. So you moved there. Yeah. Like, so if you were to attack this weakness, the way to do it would be to, to move to a place or to, to choose to fish a a lake that didn't have the shallow water. Like you like to fish, you have to learn the deep water and you, and you, you can do that, and I've tr- I've tried doing that, and I'm going to be kind of counter to, I mean, th- everybody's different as far as as what they need to embrace. But my my whole philosophy is that in sports and in anything great, uh, you know, a- any type of you know art or or mm-hmm. anything, you have to have a specific strength. Okay. There's nobody that is just the best at everything. Mm, okay. You're right about that. Because you look at any sport and the, the greatest in each sport, it's not like, you know, Tom Brady's, you know, doing everything on that field. He's really strong at something. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, what a team is all about. And uh, when it comes to, to fishing, it's this, it's the same exact thing. There's, uh, you look at somebody like Kevin Van Dam. I'm not going to throw down with him with deep diving crankbaits. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at somebody like, um, uh, oh shoot, who would I, I was going to say like Skeet Reese with a, a drop shot or something mm-hmm. or no, Aaron Martin's with a drop shot. Skeet Reese is good with a drop shot, but Aaron Martin's is really good with it. I'm not throwing down with that guy, but when it comes to shallow water power fishing, I'm not competing against those guys. I'm competing against the fish because I am in my element. That is my playground. That's where I go to work. For me, that's that's kind of been the whole key to to my success. Is like I had two years where I was doing terrible, and it was because I was trying to embrace those other techniques. Mm. And so you've got to what you've got to do is you've got to learn everything, and then throw everything that you don't feel comfortable with, kind of out the window, or so or or said. continue to to <laughs> really did yeah. you say that? No, there's a very famous Bruce Lee quote that. That says um, almost exactly that. Yeah, to to embrace embrace everything. Ah, the, then, the the punch. I want I want to uh, I want to uh, what was it? what do you say? I want I want to I believe in the guy that that can uh, that knows one punch or practices one punch a thousand times. Then yeah. then well, you know it was it was something to to the that was a really of, bad recall of, of a yeah, quote. Well, yeah, and it was a different <laughs> quote, but it was something. You, you shouldn't be afraid of the guy that knows 10,000 moves, but the guy yeah. that has practiced that's what it was 10,000 yeah. times. Yeah. Um, it was just certainly true in wrestling, which is my, my domain there. But in, in, uh, in, in this, it was, it was basically, um, learn as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Keep what is useful, throw away what's not. Yeah. And, and that was Bruce Lee's philosophy of, uh, you know, he was the, he was the first guy that, you know, it, it, Bruce Lee was was really the father of modern day UFC fighting because he, um, a, at the time of Bruce Lee, he was he was a guy that um, uh, was contrary to so much yeah. of, of what was going on in martial arts. You were either a Taekwondo guy or you were a Judo guy or you were, you know, it, all of these different things. And Bruce Lee was the first guy that said, "Well, look, man, there's there's something in Judo that's really good." Yeah. You can, whip people's ass with that and then over here this this has something that's really interesting yeah and and, you know western boxing is is interesting for these reasons and i'm going to absorb what's useful and i'm going to throw away everything else and that's a that's a really good point and and one thing that i need to mention when it comes to this whole this whole topic is the fact that i'm not just i don't just fish shallow 
Okay, because I learned all these different techniques, I also learned how to fish in clear water. I learned techniques that I really felt confident in and and enjoyed fishing clear clear water, deep water, and shallow water mm-hmm. in all different conditions. So it's really important to not only uh, become uh, have a strength, but also have strengths in each category. Mm, yeah, is you know you can't you can't be the best at everything. There's always going to be somebody that's better at you, and you need to make sure that you're not playing against somebody that's better at you than than or better than you at something. Right. Um, right. You know, because that's that's just in fishing. I, I think that a lot of people overlook that, but nobody's going to do something uh, in in a professional sport, you know, like football or baseball. They're not gonna they're not gonna do something that somebody else that's standing right across from them can do way better, and they know it. Right. So why would yeah, you, you get that find a, You got to find a way. And yeah. that's what you've done. So when you're going, I always think about being a bass fisherman and being a rodeo cowboy or a professional wrestler as kind of, as kind of a similar kind of deal. Like here you are in this one place and tournament's over, pack it up, move on. So same kind of deal with, with a, with a rodeo cowboy, you know, they, they ride the rodeo. They put their stuff up, they get in the truck, and they head to the next one. Yeah. And there's a lot of time spent between one venue and the next. And I always kind of wonder, like I, I pass a lot of bass fishermen on the road, and I always kind of wonder, it seems like seems like kind of a solitary existence. Some people have somebody else in the truck with them, but not 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 many. They're usually by themselves. <laughs> what do you do when you're when you're doing that much driving? I make a lot of phone calls. And I listen to a lot of music and podcasts. Uh, as of as of recently, podcasts have kind of taken over until I run out of data on my phone, which happens within the first three days of <laughs> so, each month. <laughs> well, I also listen to a ton of podcasts. What What do you like? Uh, School of Greatness mm-hmm. is a really good Lewis one. House. That one, yeah, that one's a really good one. There's one a lot favorites. of really cool stories on that. Uh, I like some of the 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 murder mysteries. Oh, yeah, you have to turn me on to a couple of those. Yeah, like uh, Up and Vanished, really good one. I don't um, know. I don't know. That. <clears throat> Serial was a good one. Yeah, Serial was like the first one to kind of uh, that was the catalyst for all these different mor- murder mystery. Yeah, podcasts. Well, I loved I loved <clears throat> uh, Serial, and and that really grabbed me. Um, and I was already a podcast listener, but more of conversational, like like what we're doing here. Yeah, we're yeah. just talking, but. Um, Serial was this obviously incredibly well researched, yes. <laughs> unbelievably well produced thing where they it was an art form, man. They they took the story and they took some general conversation by the narrator and then they then they insert these little pieces of interviews with a little bit of music here and there to tell the story. It was that it, in its own was unbelievable. It was just like it but was the way a piece of they art. told it was 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 beyond question one of the greatest things to have listened to ever. Much better than TV because TV is taking. I mean, they they just had to paint such an intricate picture. Yeah, but you know, the only thing that we could even begin to <sighs> compare serial to is make a murderer on Netflix. Yes, yeah, okay? yeah. So they did a very good job. Yeah, they did. They did a very good job. It was kind of a similar kind of thing where they tell a story through a narration, then they bring in interviews, they bring in uh, pieces of film, they bring in this and that, and tell the story that in its own, if it was a Hollywood movie, you wouldn't believe it because the truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah, And, yeah. and you know, I, I love podcasts like that. I listen to a ton of podcasts. I like, I like history ones. I'm a big fan of Joe Rogan's podcast, Lewis Howes. I like... Um, some that are not well known at all. There was one that that I actually was on called Wrestling with Success, and then it um, changed to uh, Success through Failure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's this guy Jim Harshaw. He was a great uh, collegiate wrestler, and he tells these stories about um, how failure has really helped people to find their success ultimately, yeah. and that it that, that it wouldn't be possible without failure, and therefore. You should embrace failure, right? right. Like, yeah. like, well, like I the, think that, that's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. About like that goes um, right in back in. Yeah, about the fishing thing is that is that you've got to embrace failure. You got to go places and you got to fish and and do things that 
don't work so that you yeah. know when it counts, you know, eh, it's probably not going to work. You got to know what, <laughs> what you suck at. Yeah. Yeah. But I like that. Uh, I also do a lot of driving. I drive, you know, uh, to Key West a lot and, you know, around the state of Florida and, and, um, and then, you know, follow my children around as they're doing their, their athletic events, whether it's wrestling or, or cheerleading or, or lacrosse. So I'm all over the country too. And the podcast, has just really, it has really revolutionized what I do. That I used to listen to a lot of audiobooks, so I do a lot of uh, running and and long exercise. And I've always listened to audiobooks. And I wish I had known this when I was in high school because, man, I am not a good reader. I'm just not. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, as a paper book, you know, pa- I fall asleep after the first I, page. I do too. I fall I, asleep. And what I've found is that, man, if I can be running and listening to something, my retention of that material is about, it's not like a little bit better. Yeah. It's like 10,000 times better. I can remember quotes. I can remember all this different stuff if I am doing some sort of a moving and I'm able to listen to this stuff. So driving is very similar. If I'm driving and and I'm the only one in the car, that's a big thing. I need to be the only one there. So I can adjust the the volume to where I I want it, and it's usually booming like an uh, like a podcast is booming, yeah, really loud. And I don't know, man. I just absorb it. I find that that it makes the time pass really quickly. Have you ever listened to uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History? No, no, Dude, I haven't listened to that one. If you're going to drive to California, you could make it probably just by stopping for gas by by listening to Dan Carlin's. Um, Blueprint for Armageddon. Oh, man. Unbelievable. I mean, there's another guy. That's a guy that is as good as, well, it it is. But what he does is he tells stories about history that that you already know. You studied in school and it was boring. And then he finds a way to tell it in a way that it's captivating. Yeah, yeah. And and he's, he's like that because, and he's turning out that kind of material because he's as passionate about that as you and I are about fishing. Mm-hmm. And he finds this way to connect with the audience and finds this way to bring this story to life like you've never heard it before. So you're listening to how World War I started. Um, and, and you're like, well, you know, I kind of remember yeah. how World, a little bit about World War I or World War II or Vietnam or, or any, any historical period of time. Mm-hmm. But he just finds a way to, to just tell it in such a way that's, that's awesome. Um, but I'll have to check out these, these mystery ones because I yeah. really like that. Like if they leave you hanging a little bit, oh, you got to get out yeah. and it's, get some gas and you're like, God, I can't wait to start the car up and get back in there. I won't, I won't, I won't do a, another podcast that, that hasn't ended already. I need closure. I can't, I can't wait for oh, like the you next would, week. You wouldn't start on I am, cereal. I am the quintessential millennial you're a binger. when it comes to yeah i need to i need to know now what yeah. happens next well you wouldn't just skip to the last step no last no no episode. but i mean i can't wait for the next episode they you because they always tease you at the end of those those mysteries like they give you a little clip of a of a phone conversation that's like oh, I know. oh man oh, yeah oh no, no. this is gonna be and, big and now you, know? you gotta wait a week oh yeah but, i don't, you know, I don't I also that. find that that this new way of of consuming stuff is uh uh, you know, binge watching on Netflix or or listening to you know the entire season of Serial in in thirteen hours straight is I find that I, again I retain the material better. Like yeah. if I have to wait a week, yeah. Then even though they do a little pretty nice job right at the beginning of kind of catching you up to what happened on the last one, I still find that it's it's more enjoyable for me to just you know do quite a few together. Yeah. And then the other thing is I find that like. um even like Lewis Howes or Joe Rogan or somebody, I'll listen to two or three of their podcasts and, you know, they're long, you know, three hours long. Yeah. I and like Then I'll those. give them a break. Then I'll give them, I'll put them down for a while and I'll go, I'll move on to something else. Yeah. And, and then come back, you know, a few weeks later, listen to four or five, three, four or five, whatever. And, uh, and that keeps it fresh for me. I, I like to do that, but I've on my phone, man, I've got, I've got ton. Let's see what else I got on here. Ike Live was the one that that got me interested in uh, in podcasts. Huh. I started listening to that, and oh, dude, I was hooked. Those guys are a hoot, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
Jocko Willink. Do you know who he is? No. Okay, Jocko Willink is a Navy SEAL, and he wrote this book called Extreme Ownership. And oh, yeah. It's probably I know. one of the best yeah, books yeah, I've yeah. ever read. He has a podcast. Read it, but... There's now 64 episodes. That I'm looking on my phone. That's one that I would highly recommend. Um, let's see. Let me look at my podcast. I tried that social media marketing one that you told me about. It was okay. Kind of lost me a little bit. Keep hammering. Cameron Haynes. Very good. I listen to a lot of them on on um, what to eat and and working out and stuff. Found my fitness. How about Radio Lab? I haven't listened to that one. Dude. Oh man, those are good. Those are good. As far as fishing, if you're into fly fishing, April Vokey, she does a fly fishing one, and she has some really really good guests on that. Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, Art of Manliness. Those keep me busy for the most part. Radio Lab. Radio Lab is another one that is that is incredibly well done, very well produced. It's not just conversation. These are well written stories. Yeah, yeah. And they 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 tell it in a way that is that is really good. I like that. Um, so, do you think all um, bass fishermen are basically doing kind of the same thing when they're traveling from place to place like that? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I I would say I used to be really really like I could not. I planned my my trip based on my my music. Well, I, I guess that's kind of a conf- confusing way to put it, but I actually planned my music based on my trip. Like I would, I know how I'd feel during a, a certain part of the trip, so I'd actually set out my CDs. <laughs> like, dude, at, at, as soon as it started getting dark, I'd put on like a uh, 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 "Wish You Were Here" Pink Floyd. And Whoa! Yeah, that would put me right to sleep, dude. Yeah, the shine on you, crazy diamond. Right when the sun's going down, yeah, is pretty is, sweet. Yeah, it's a pretty pretty awesome feeling. Tell me, what is it? What is it at uh, three o'clock in the morning when you got to push Led through? Zeppelin? That's it. Yeah, Led Zeppelin, and I start it with uh, Ramble On. Oh, yeah. So I actually that's had a not mi- what I choose. I had a mix, and uh, but you know, but that's if I just wake up. If I have already been awake and have been driving during that now, time, this is this is the time this, when you got to push through, man. You're going to put the boat in at five, probably and it's three now, probably two or tool, hmm. like some tool. You yeah, know what I go with what the D, <laughs> the tenacious D, tenacious D. Dude, that's actually <laughs> that's actually one of my oh. oh, dude, I I am all about the tenacious D because it's one of the only albums that I can sing to. From oh. beginning to end, yes. and it just wakes me up. You can and, sing your lungs out. Oh yeah, and uh, you know it is. It is always. <laughs> it is always on my phone. And now the phones are different because you have like Spotify and stuff. Yeah, but uh, the album I've got on my phone right now. I I do too. Tribute. Yes, the album is just the Tenacious D album. Yeah. 21 songs, Kilbasa, one note, tribute, Wonder Boy. Wonder couple, Boy. A couple of ones that we might not say. <laughs> Explosivo, <laughs> Dio, Inward Singing, Kyle Quit the Band, The Road, Cock Push Ups, Lee, Friendship Test, <laughs> Friendship, Karate Schnitzel, Karate, Rock Your Socks, Drive Through, Double Team, City Hall, and you're there. All of a sudden, you're there. Yeah. I no, it's tonight that that album is actually I'm glad you brought that up because it if I am really really tired it usually goes you playing it right now just a little bit it's yeah. in the back kind of, it's in the back you won't even be able to tell oh yeah that's this will get you through right here <laughs> but you can't do the air drum <laughs> it only matters if it rocks. <laughs> the main thing that we do is to rock your socks off. Yeah, see, you know what's up. I don't I don't wear socks, but another one that's on the kind of the same level for me is Pink Floyd the Wall. Pink Floyd is my favorite band. And but I can only play it during I have to honor it by playing it during certain times of the day when I'm in that mood. Yeah. And I can't play it during the daytime. Like it's gotta be like nighttime or dark outside. So this is this is something that I've noticed about about well. My friends, mostly. So my friends are my friends consist of the most eclectic group of people that you would ever run into. Yeah. If you were to line them all up against a wall. So most of them, there is one thing that 
that is consistent, the constant of my friends. They are passionate people. Sometimes they're creatives. Sometimes they are exceptionally good at what they do. They might be a lawyer, might be a doctor, they might be a fisherman, they might be whatever. So with this group of people, I've got workout guys, I've got fishing guys, I've got hunting guys, and then I've got people that in my in my group of friends that don't even know that I fish for a living. They <laughs> They just don't. They and then then a whole bunch of people that think I work out for a living. Well, I, I, if, at your house, there's yeah. there's no way that I would have taken <laughs> fishing from this place. Well, no, you hadn't seen that room. Yeah. Um, but and then I have another room at, at another place. But the one thing that holds true is each of these people has some wild ass idiosyncrasies that make us all really weird. <laughs> we are like, yeah. like you're you're wanting to honor Pink Floyd by playing them at a yeah. certain time of the day. That's uh that's that's hey, interesting. It, Do you find that other bass fishermen are are is, as interested no. in their music? N- well, you, yeah. I mean, I, everybody's got their their own thing. I I don't so know if they're as you this. this is something that I've that I've, I've I've thought should take off, but it hasn't. How come nobody listens to music on the boat? I do on occasion, but I honestly can't do it while I'm while I'm I mean, fishing. You guys that are much. out there for I can't fifteen Jimmy, hours a day. Can't you just put on some headphones or what? Jimmy Buffett? Jimmy. Well, Buffett? the headphones are a no-no Maybe because you can't hear up. your surroundings. So you can't hear a fish jump or you know so on and so forth. Right. That's that's why because you know you're taking those those audible and visual cues from you know your mm-hmm. surroundings to help you build the, you know, that puzzle. Yeah. And so it, with music, it kind of takes away from that. It's interesting, man. When I'm driving, though, when I'm driving my boat from location to location, I crank that up, man. Hmm. It's interesting. I love music. I love listening to music. I will sometimes drive for hours at a time in complete silence. Just give it a break, you know, or, or just think of time. Or maybe you find yourself getting off the phone and you put the phone down. And the next thing you know, you're like, man, I just drove for two hours. <laughs> it's been completely <laughs> silent. Um, so that does happen. But, you know, I almost always have a stereo in my boat yeah. of some sort. Now it's really easy. You just get the speakers. You got the Sonic Cub thing. The, yeah, and and you, just plug in your, you just plug in your your iPod. And next thing you know, you're listening to whatever you want. But you know when I listen to music? Hmm. When I'm washing the boat. Yeah. That's it. When I'm working on tackle. And- I don't listen. I don't listen, man. I don't listen to it when I'm fishing. I don't listen to it when I'm driving the boat. I don't yeah. listen to it any time at all. Because... When I'm driving the boat, I'm constantly listening for something to explode. Like every, <laughs> I always the think, engine? I always think that at any second something's yeah. gonna something's just gonna let loose. And you you know how we're, it is, man. You're we're, just we're, we're just very, kind of driving along, and you're like, "What was that noise?" Yeah, like it's just a different noise. And you're like, yeah. oh, "I'm I'm 30 miles offshore. <laughs> like this is not good. Like what is that noise? It, it, should I turn around now?" Yeah, like. You know, and so then you, oh, it's just a water bottle ra- rolling around yeah. on the floor. Or I have the same it's, thing. It's my client making this funny sound with his mouth. It's like, how about, could you please stop that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're making me super nervous. But I don't listen to music, man, because you miss all of that stuff. You miss those opportunities where, where you're hearing something might happen to the boat or you're, you're, you, you, just like you say, you know, you, you see a, 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 a fish jump or, or hear something. I'd never have, gotten into listening to it but you know you 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 got this whole pimp my boat thing and you got you know you're looking at the trucks that, that a lot of the bass fishermen are driving and a lot of the saltwater guys are driving too and you're thinking man that guy's probably got a rock and stereo in his boat which i'm sure some do yeah but i haven't seen anybody listen to the music yeah out there, out there i i actually i don't listen to it as much and there was like one turning point for me so i, I bought this boat it was actually an oakley big bass boat and uh so I bought it after, you know, they, they're when they were going to give it back to Nitro. And I was just like, I want it. So I'll buy it. And so the first tournament was on Okeechobee. And, uh, and I was super excited because it had a really awesome Sony stereo system mm. in it. A nice big old amp and, and four speakers in it. So it got really loud. And so I'm making this run and I am just amped up on life. You know, I'm, I'm running through these little narrow boat trails and stuff on, on Okeechobee 
get out to this wide open space down on the North Shore area. And I'm like, I'm rocking out to like Alice in Chains. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and I'm driving by all of these guys. And, you know, I probably drove by like 20 guys just fishing in this open water area. And then I sat down, turn off the music, and I realized how, how quiet it was and how much of a ruckus I made. I felt like such an ass by yeah. doing that. It was, I, I mean, I was just like, uh, and ever since I was just like, man, you know, it's kind of it, it, subconsciously, you're just like, you know, I'm out here for nature. Yeah, you know? but you'd still think there'd be that bad boy. You know, the, the bass fish. I was that bad Glenn boy Plake, that one time. With the Glen Plake mohawk that just listens to music super loud and yeah, they're, just, they they exist. Shit. They, they really? usually yeah, they exist. They're usually at at the club level. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> because they they want to they want to show off the the uh, the the big speakers and it, but when you get I don't know I, I, there's it, I'm I'm not saying anything against you know club level guys, uh, but it's like I don't know I, I I don't see a whole lot of people really rocking out to it. There's no place for it. Yeah, really isn't. Yeah, sometimes you see That's it at, at the launch ramp in the morning. Yeah, like sometimes I'll I'll be rocking some tool pretty hardcore when I get the launch ramp. I'm that guy. Yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, not anymore. Then you miss I, your turn. Somebody's going, "Hey, man, it's your turn. Go in, back in, back in." Yeah. I guess you didn't hear me. I'm in. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, you're like, "Hey, man, how come you just cut in front of me? I was yelling at you for 30 minutes. You were just listening to Tool." Yeah. <laughs> It's a good excuse. <laughs> All right. So you're here picking up a boat, right? Yep. Brand new Phoenix 920 Pro XP, man. Really stoked on it. It's got a Yamaha on it. And I'm really excited about uh, getting a Yamaha because I've been guiding in Alaska for 12 years during yep. the summers. And uh, and we rely on Yamaha for our lives. <laughs> yeah. Really, you know, when you're fishing in those really rough conditions, you have to uh, transition from, you know, one part of the uh the inside passage to the other in like 10 foot waves which doesn't sound like a whole lot but they get pretty close together and pretty <laughs> scary you know or what even size bigger boat is that they're like 23 footer 23 footer and how big are the waves they're they're i mean they they can range up to 15 feet i've been in in 13 footers is the biggest i've been in but they are we've got tremendous tides is the is the problem? So they get you really get the wind and the tide. They get going really close together. Against so one it's nothing there, mess you up. It's nothing like rollers that you see out in open ocean. But anyways, yeah, really excited about fishing out of that boat. Really well, that's super cool. stoked. Yeah. So did you get a stereo in that thing? Yeah, I've got the Sonic Hub. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, we're gonna go pick that thing up tomorrow, and then we'll check it out. Maybe we'll uh, we'll do another one, do another podcast on the on the new boat. Oh, that'd be sweet. Well, that's cool. Well, I think this has been good to catch up and um been fun. Man, we touched on a lot of different things. Sponsorship and getting started and weirdness and Pink podcasts Floyd. and wow, just a <laughs> wild conversation. But you know what? That's really um when I first started thinking about doing a podcast, I would have these conversations with my friends, fishing friends, workout friends, whatever. And we're talking about all this crazy stuff. And I'm thinking Man, I this should people, be recorded. I think people would like to know this stuff. Yeah. I mean, really, when it, when it, especially about the sponsorship, that's that, that people I really want to know about I that. I think that's, if anybody, they should just fast forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then forget all the stuff about Pink Floyd and Tenacious D. Um, but if you don't know who Tenacious D is, do yourself a favor, check it out. It's Jack Black at doing his finest work and Kyle gas. You yeah. got to give Kyle gas. Credit. Well, I would, I, I was going there, man. You got there too quickly. Kyle gas, who is also known for being an elf and many other things. A man child. He is a man child. Um, and you've met Kyle gas, right? Yeah. He actually, uh, pushed me in the face. Sweet. Cause <laughs> my wife and I were at the stage and, and he like pushed me away. So that he could talk to your wife. Yeah, yeah. Just, 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 you know, he was just joking, sort of, I guess. I don't know. I hope. <laughs> but he was, he was super cool after the show. We got to hang out with him. Did a you bit. see the movie where, where, you know, they get ready to, to write the, the greatest song in the world? Yeah. And then they forget to push the, record. The, the, what would the, you say if I told you that I forgot to push record? Oh, well. Always push record. Always push record. 
<laughs> anyway, on that note, we're going to end this one. Um, so Miles Berghoff, tell us how to tell us how to find you. You can find me on all the social media platforms, or the majority of them: Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you, you can generally find me by uh, typing in like Miles Berghoff or Miles Sonar Berghoff on Instagram at Sonar Fishing on Twitter. But my my website is is SonarFishing dot com, and of course the the uh, um, Sweetwater platforms. Same thing. We're on all the major platforms, and then we're also on a really cool. Other than the TV you know, uh, portion, you know, we've got NBC sports sportsman's channel, and, uh, you also have sun sports down in Florida. We also are on something called waypoint TV, which, I mean, you guys know <laughs> better than I do because y- you guys have, uh, really embraced it. And that's a online streaming platform for, for all fishing shows. Mm-hmm. Totally and free. It, it is so awesome. And it's just, it's like the Netflix of Netflix is actually the waypoint TV of, of, uh, movies. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to think of it. Yeah. So you can find you can go to waypointtv.com and and check us out there. All right. All right. Well, I'm sure everybody will. All right, Miles, my friend. Good talking with you. And I look forward to picking up your new boat tomorrow and checking that out. So uh we are out. Thank See you, you guys later. Hey everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope you got something out of that. Got just a little bit of news. We have started a weekly show that is designed to be up to the minute videos of what's happening this week, mostly in the Florida Keys, but also in other places that we fish as well. We'll be putting that out every week. And the best way to find that is to subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube slash Saltwater Experience. Search Saltwater Experience on YouTube, subscribe to that channel, and you will get updates of when a new video is published. I've also figured out how to put the podcast on YouTube, finally. A lot of people like to put that window behind other things they're working on and listen to the podcast while they are working. So we now have that for you. And there is a playlist called podcast. There's a playlist called weekly show. You can go and see all the new videos that we're putting up there. Started a new email address specifically for this show. And that is podcast at saltwaterexperience.com podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. Those emails come directly to me. I'll see every single one of them. So if you have comments, suggestions, ways we can make the show better, and particularly if you have suggestions of someone you would like to see me sit down with in the hunting world, in the fishing world, in the outdoor sports world, or just a motivation, inspirational character, or someone that can teach us all something, I'm very interested in your suggestions. So that's podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. You can get the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and we're also publishing it on the blog The weekly show will be published on the blog too, but the best way is to go to YouTube, subscribe there, and you'll get it immediately when it's published. So until next week, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon.